So thank you again for your time, ladies and gentlemen. And I apologize once again also for not being able to be there with you today. The Hospital Research Foundation and its charity affiliate, Mesha, play an incredibly important role in acknowledging the stories, the contribution and the impact that our dedicated service men and women have on both our country and our communities. These institutions don't just support the servicemen and women, the individuals who've served, they also support their families and their loved ones who also have very important stories to tell. And if there's one thing I've been privileged to discover as a journalist, it's the incredible importance often overlooked of merely acknowledging the service and the sacrifice of the veterans and their families. It's so incredibly important. It matters. That's what this day is all about, of course. For better or for worse, quite unusually, I would argue, a large part of Australia's sense of itself, its nationhood, is tied up in its service in military conflicts, especially in the First World War. It's one of our defining origin myths. The stories we tell about the First World War are often not entirely accurate. Sometimes they're myths that have distorted historical truth. Too often they sanitised the horrors of war and glorified the conflict. And too often they hid the appalling toll not only on the servicemen, but also on their families and loved ones back home. That's what the Lost Diggers is all about. It was an incredible voyage of discovery for me, and it began 10 years ago. We made a serendipitous discovery of these incredible glass photographic plates hidden in the attic of a French farmhouse in a little village called Vignacourt. Now, Vignacourt, you'll see there on the map, there's a town called Amiens, a city in the north of France. It's up in the region called Picardy, and just north of Amiens is a little village called Vignacourt. And during the First World War, Vignacourt was one of the prime towns that was recognised by the Allies as an important place for soldiers to have R&R. &R. It was recognised that because of the incredible privations of First World War trench conflict, soldiers often really could only endure about a week or two weeks on the front lines. And after shelling and the appalling treatment on the Western Front, they needed somewhere, if they'd survived, to get back to their sanity and rest and carouse. And Vignacourt was one of those towns. And in that town, there was a lovely husband and wife couple, Louis Tullier and his beautiful wife, Antoinette. They lost their farm because the British had requisitioned it. And so Louis, who had a hobby of photography, he was a First World War veteran himself, he decided to use his camera to sell photographs to passing soldiers who came through the town and offer them for a few francs an image of themselves that they could show their mates or send back home. And it was incredibly popular, and we know it was incredibly popular because when we found, when we discovered this incredible treasure, we discovered that Contrary to how you normally used glass photographic plates in those days, Louis and Antoinette had actually kept the negatives. They hadn't wiped the emulsion off the glass and reused the glass, as often happened. They recognised the historical value of these photographs. And I think it was because so many of the men who came through this little town, going up again to the front lines, they never came back. I have to say, one of the tragedies in this case is that Louis was so wrecked by the experience of the First World War, probably from the memory of these men that he'd photographed, that in about 1930, he blew his brains out with a pistol. And his wife, Antoinette, the reason why this photographic collection stayed hidden for so long was because his wife, Antoinette, was so distraught by his loss, by his suicide, that she basically got the photographs, threw them all in boxes, and threw them up in the farthest corner of her attic, and forgot about them. And it was forgotten about for nearly 100 years. 
in this house. This is where the discovery was made. This was the family home when we discovered it. It was actually empty in 2010, 2011, we were, when we were filming there. The, the relatives of the Tulliers who owned the home didn't realise that these images were there. They had no appreciation of the significance of this discovery. And it was Peter Burness, this gentleman here, who was the official First World War historian for the Australian War Memorial, who put us onto this trail. I asked him once, what was an unsolved mystery in the Australian War Memorial? And he told me about these images that all had the same distinctive backdrop. They were a particularly peculiar and almost modern style of photography, often showed soldiers in quite a, a happy light, drinking, carousing, bouncing pretty girls on their knee, as you'll see. And Bernier said it was a mystery about what had happened to this collection. Nobody knew where it was. All he knew was the name of the photographer, Tullier. And so we went to France and we dug for a few weeks and we eventually discovered this little town called Vignacourt and learned that there had indeed been a photographer called Louis Tullier who'd lived there. And eventually we were allowed permission by his family, the surviving family, to search the house. And most of the house was deserted because it was about to be sold. But the attic was jammed to the gunnels. And uh, French farmers, thank God, don't throw anything away. And so one of the first things we removed from this attic were thousands, literally thousands, of World War II jerry cans that the Nazis had left on nearby fields as they went through in their attack on Paris. And the farmers had picked up these jerry cans and just filled up the attic. And so literally, as we emptied this attic, we were literally peeling back history. We peeled back the World War II jerry cans, then we found 1930s cycling magazines, beautiful Parisian cycling magazines that also turned out to be worth quite a lot of money. And then at the very back of this attic, we found these three treasure chests, because that's what they are. They're full of the most extraordinary treasure, over 4,000 images on glass photographic plates of Allied soldiers in World War I. Brits, Americans, French, Nepalese Gurkhas, African soldiers who'd come in from the French colonies, and Australians. And the incredible thing was they were all so incredibly well preserved. And uh, when Peter Burness climbed up into this attic with me and started going through these photographs, very soon he started recognising faces in them. This story, the story of um, Edward Falloon, Tiny Falloon as his mates called him, is a pretty typical story. Tiny had fought at the Battle of Lone Pine. He was an engineer with the Australians and he fought valiantly repairing ramparts that the soldiers used to return fire against the Turks. And he and his men earned huge praise from the Australian commanders for often operating in full view of the enemy as they tried to keep the trenches together as they were being bombarded by Turkish shellfire. And if that wasn't enough, he then went on, as so many of them did, one of the original Anzacs, he then went on to serve with great distinction on the Western Front. And one of the horrible battles that Tiny went through was the Battle of Pozier, the meat grinder battle of Pozier, where so many thousands of Australians died. It was a horrific conflict. And Tiny, fortunately, was one of the survivors. And we know we can actually place when his second field company of Australian engineers came to the village of Vignacourt, because the service history of that regiment shows when they arrived in the town. And by looking at the distinctive ribbons, the service ribbons, the sergeant's ribbons, and other badges on Tiny's uniform, we were able, with the help of his family, to identify who he was. And the great tragedy was that Tiny almost made it all the way through the war. He got through to April 1918, and he was in Belgium with his unit, at the village of Plugstedt in Belgium, when he was killed almost immediately, I'm told, by machine gun fire to the head. And his distraught men buried him in a shell hole where he lay, and sadly, his body was never recovered. Now, normally, that's where the story ends, of course. Heroic sacrifice, 
tragedy, wretchedly sad story. But what really struck me, and this is one of the things about the Lost Diggers that I think reflects the work of the Foundation and of Mesha, it's the importance of the impact on the families and on the loved ones of people like Tiny Falloon. Because Tiny's sister, Kathleen, and the rest of the family were absolutely devastated by his passing. But what really underlined their suffering was their treatment by the Australian Defence Department for several years after he was killed. Because in those days, when somebody died on the First World War battlefield, their possessions, whatever possessions they had, were sent back. And this included the military medal that Tiny was awarded, a precious memento of his contribution to the conflict, something his family dearly wanted. And sadly, as his boat carrying the possessions of Tiny Falloon was coming back to Australia, it was torpedoed by the Germans. And as a result, all of his possessions were lost. And not unreasonably, the family asked for a duplicate medal. And for several years, the Defence Department, in an act of utter bureaucratic bastardry, refused to give the family a replica medal because Tiny was supposedly responsible, even though he was dead, for having lost his medal while it was being sent back to his next of kin. And after three or four years, General Birdwood, in retirement, awarded Tiny his medal. And you might think that's the end of it, but it actually got worse because 50 years later, the service file shows that when the Australian government in 1967 awarded the medal known as the Anzac Medal, Tiny was again refused, for some inexplicable reason, his Anzac Medal. So the family has been very, very badly treated. And you can only imagine the pain that that's caused to that family over several generations since the First World War. It underlines the importance of advocacy organisations like the Foundation and Mesha. And so I was hugely proud when this image of Tiny that we'd recovered from the Lost Diggers archive that the family had never seen before was reproduced and put in full view to thousands of people who toured the Remember Me exhibition at the Australian War Memorial from 2012. Tiny's image became an icon of the Lost Diggers collection. Now, one of the things that I think is incredibly important about the Lost Diggers collection is that these images trace the beginnings of Australian nationhood. I want you to look very, very closely at the man sitting on the left and look at that little bracelet that he's wearing. And you'll see another one on the wrist of the man lying on the floor. This photograph was taken in 1918, shortly after the war had ended. These guys have been having a wine or two. They're carousing. They know the war's over. They know they're going home. They're impatient to get home. As they say, we want our mummies. They're Aussie diggers. And the fascinating thing is, they signed up as British subjects. They swore an oath of allegiance to the British Empire. But what these photographs trace is the transition that occurred. Because after four or five years of war, they no longer identified so much as British subjects. They'd seen the reality of the British Empire at places like Pozier, Bulacore, Gallipoli, Lone Pine. And those little wrist bracelets that they're wearing, they are made out of bully beef tins and they are maps of Australia. They recognised themselves as Australian. What you're looking at there is the beginning of Australian nationhood. It's a story that matters. And that's why I'm so proud of these lost digger images, because they trace not only the stories of individual veterans, but the beginning of the sense of ourselves as a nation. And you can see in these images, the thing I love about them is the carousing. You know, they were having fun. They were sending images back home. They didn't want to send maudlin images of themselves back to their families. They wanted to show mum and dad that they were having a high old time. And Louis and Antoinette gave them that opportunity. They'd ham it up as here for the cameras. They'd also enjoy the fact that they could drink a bottle of wine, bounce a pretty French girl on their knee, 
there were more than a few babies made in Vinu Kaur in this period of history. I love this image too for the simple fact that it shows soldiers in a state of reasonable sobriety and then not too long later they're totally and utterly inebriated, almost falling off their chairs. This photograph's also historically significant and there are a lot of these in the collection. The gentleman on the lower right is Joe Maxwell, who by the end of the war was a lieutenant. He was also one of the most highly decorated servicemen in World War I. And if I zoom into that medal ribbon, which we could do with these incredibly detailed images, you can see that in this photograph he had a military cross with a bar, that's the little nipple in the middle of the, um, the ribbon in the middle, and you can also see he's got a distinguished conduct medal ribbon, a DCM ribbon. Now we know that Joe earned the Victoria Cross later in the war, so because of this, with some detective work by my beautiful wife who learned how to read the archives in the Australian National Archives, we were actually able to place this image as being shot sometime between September 1917 and November 1918. I'm not going to name the soldier in this image, but it's one of the other stories of war that doesn't get told. All of these men were heroic. All of these men served in the First World War trenches. All of them suffered. One of them, the guy on the bottom right, Lieutenant George Leslie Macon, died. He had his legs blown off. But another of the gentlemen in this image, and I won't name him, he doesn't deserve to be vilified like he was at the time, he cracked. And his service file records the reality of war. It records how he was found trembling inside a little dugout when his men were up on the front line. He just completely lost his bottle. There should be no shame in that. As Ashley Eakins, one of the First World War historians, has told me, he thinks every man had a certain amount of courage and that after a while, no matter how brave you were, you couldn't stand what you were experiencing. And so one of the men in this image cracked and was sent home to Australia in ignominy and shamed for the rest of the uh, war. And in fact, when it, when it came to him being given service medals after the war, the Defence Department treated him as if he was a disgrace, which in itself is a disgrace. We have to acknowledge that there is a reality to war that wasn't acknowledged at this time. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, Men did suffer terribly in war. Have a look here at this image of the gentleman standing on the left. There's several images of this guy in the collection. We don't know who he is, but it was my wife who picked this out. As we went through the images, there was something about his eyes. This gentleman, whoever he is, had seen something horrific. He's got eyes that register shock and he's never been able to get rid of it. And it's quite sad because a lot of these men ended up in repat hospitals after the war. The precursors of the Foundation and Mesha provided entirely honourable service in looking after men like this after the war, who frankly just couldn't cope with peacetime reality. Look at this poor fellow. He didn't even try and smile, but he wanted a record of his face. He wanted to be remembered. And that's the thing about the Lost Diggers images. They are a profound record, not just of hilarity and fun in a small village behind the Somme Valley. They're a record of men who frankly often knew they were going to their deaths in future battles. This image is one of them. This is actually an image of British soldiers. They're members of the 6th West Yorkshire's Regiment. I'm pretty sure this was shot just before they went into the battle. And if you look at all of these men, they just served for two weeks, we know, in forward trenches and had the hell hammered out of them with artillery. I can't tell each of their individual stories here, but two of them would die in the battle. But I want you to look again at the eyes of these men. And if you zoom into those eyes, they tell a story of suffering. I was privileged to be able to pass on those images to the British representatives of the 6th West Yorkshires. 
And for them, it's a priceless record of a regiment that was completely and utterly decimated in the opening battle of World War I. 20,000 men died in that battle in the first day alone. One of the other happier images in the Lost Diggers collection is one of the only known images of the moment of the end of World War I. This is the mainly the members of the 5th Battalion, Australian Regiment, standing in the square of Vignacourt, staring up at the village clock. And if you look very, very closely, you'll see at the top of the village cathedral, there's the French tricolore flag, the national flag of France. And shortly after thereafter, Joe Maxwell recorded the Australian flag was also lowered. And the reason why this is significant is because this is literally the very moment of the end of World War I. But a final parting photograph. Shortly after the end of the war, the young children of Vinucor and surrounding areas were brought to the then untended cemetery where the bodies of thousands of servicemen were laying at rest and individual children were given graves to tend. And the beautiful thing is, they still tend those graves today. There's a beautiful graveyard in Vinucor, unusually looked over by a monument, a statue of a French soldier, watching over those Australian soldiers and British soldiers with huge respect. It's the best tribute that could be paid for them. And we will never, ever forget them. Always remember them. Thank you for listening to my story.